Saratoga Sales and Jones Dirty Sales. So let's talk about the Marquis uh, de Lafayette. The Marquis de Lafayette, uh, he volunteered for the uh, Continental Army. Now, to explain the way that things were set up back during this time period, uh, you didn't become a general, an admiral, a colonel, or any of these positions through merit. Your family bought these positions for you. So if you were exceptional, you would not work your way up to these positions. And this is really the way that things are in the military until about 1920. Now, the truth is you still have some of the, uh, you don't have your normal grunts going into a position to become a, a, a general unless uh, they go to school to become an officer. So it's not anything like that, but uh, now, the, now the military is open to a lot more people than just the wealthiest people in the United States. So at the age of 19, he becomes a general because his family donates $200,000 to the cause of the American Revolution. And they are French patriots who hate the British because of uh, what happened in the French and Indian War. And in general, they just hate the British, so they're happy to, happy to do this. But that's how you get, a, get your position. Now, I will say this. In the end, the Marquis uh, de Lafayette ends up... Uh, really earning this position, but not in the beginning. Okay, so let's talk about uh, the British general. Uh, number one is uh, General Howe. Uh, he's very exceptional. He's won many battles throughout his career. Uh, but he has a complication of fighting both the Continental Army and the militias, and he has to win quickly or he'll lose Parliament's support. Uh, Having lived through a couple of wars now in my lifetime, I'll tell you this, an unpopular war is a long war. If you can get your people behind an invasion like the United States was in 2003 in Iraq, then you have everyone cheering, people writing music, and you know that goes on for about two years. But if you're still there after two years, even if the fighting only lasts six months or six weeks, which is how long it took U.S. forces to take Iraq, People don't like if you have to have an occupying force there. They want the battles. They want the war to be over quickly. On the other hand, you have uh, British General John Burgoyne, who is one of my favorite military leaders of all time, not because of his success, but because of his suck. He was an actor and a playwright who loved to spend all of his time and money writing plays and acting them out. But his parents came to him and said, you know, basically you've, You've played as much as you're going to get to in your life. It's time for you to get into the family business. It's time for you to become a man. So we're going to send you to war or we cut you off. So Burgoyne realizes what he has to do and he joins the military. But there's going to be some weird stipulations. One of those is this. He allows all of his officers to bring their wives with them on the trip. Now, does that mean his wife is there? He's not married, but he is having an affair with his best friend's wife. So he sends him off on sentry duty, and while that's going on, he will make sure his wife is taken care of, <clears throat> breaking marital vows. So instead of moving like a military unit, they're moving really slowly, cutting down trees, making sure the road is nice and smooth so the women are riding in comfort. Okay. So while he's doing this, he's getting pot, uh, constantly and relentlessly pursued by Benedict Arnold, who is going in, attacking with a couple of men at one point, and then retreating, and then goes back with 10 to 12 more men at another point later on. So we're going to get back to Burgoyne here in just a minute, but in the meantime, we have the Battle of Brandywine Creek, okay? 
And the Battle of Brandywine Creek is uh, where uh, William Howe, the great British general, defeats Washington's forces. Okay. Now, remember, all of Washington's men were untrained, but despite that, you know, they just get stomped in this battle by the British. Now, uh, General Howe, he then was going to go into the city to capture the con the uh, Continental Congress. Because if you defeat the leader of the army and then you capture the leaders of the government, then the game is over and now they're no longer going to get their independence and people in future years will have to learn English. Well, I guess we did that anyway. But... Uh, but how, by the time he gets into the city, the Continental Congress has escaped, and when he goes back to find Washington, Washington has also retreated. So he ends up staying for the winter in Philadelphia, where he and his men stay nice, safe, and warm and comfortable until the war is over. Now, Washington won't have the same, the same luck that, uh, that Howe does. Okay, at uh, Valley Forge, which is famous for the freezing, horrible winter, which is just out, a, a couple of miles outside of Philadelphia, uh, Washington settles in for the winter. Now, his men are untrained, but not for long. The great Baron von Steuben, okay, a German who had experience in the Prussian army, starts drilling and training Washington's troops to get them ready for the war. Now, does it matter that Baron von Steuben was not actually a baron? He was not titled and more of a grunt soldier than he was an officer. It doesn't matter because what he did for the, the Continental Forces at this point was revolutionary and it was, it, it was, a, it was really a turning point for the, for the military. Now, we'll talk more about turning points here in just a second, but... Uh, he trains them, and by the end of the winter, they're all ready to fight and equipped to, to fight as well. Now, the winter was harsh, and about 2,500 people died in the poor conditions. Uh, many of the troops didn't have shoes. Uh, many didn't have blankets. And most of them were sleeping in tents that were open at both, at both ends of the tent. So basically, a cold wind would blow through all the time. And not only that, it, depending on how heavy the snow was, it might get on top of the tent and soak right through to you. And you might die of hypothermia. Now, why would you risk life and limb? Well, for $20 and 100 acres, of course. Uh, $20 in today's money would be have the spending power of about 2000 So who wouldn't trade for $2,000 and... 100 acres of land. I mean, that sounds like a really, really good idea, really good plan. So this leads into the Battle of Saratoga. Now, this is not with Washington or Washington's men. This is with um, Horatio Gates. And so in, in the Battle of Saratoga, uh, as we said earlier, John Burgoyne was being pursued by Benedict Arnold. Uh, he was able to get word ahead to Horatio Gates, who kind of stood in the way, and this is a classic pincher movement where they basically will trap Burgoyne's men between Gates' men and Arnold's men. Now, in this battle, there's a, there's a really, uh, what's the right word, a, a daring uh, charge on uh, Horatio Gates that causes his lines to fall. During this charge, Benedict Arnold is wounded in the leg. And so he should have, since he was really the general that won the battle, been the one to collect the ceremonial surrender and sword of John Burgoyne, but instead that goes to Horatio Gates. Horatio Gates gains a lot of acclaim because of this victory, and people actually will start uh, calling for Horatio Gates to become the leader of the Continental Army. Uh, which, you know, of course never happens. It, it stays with uh, with Washington. But this is a turning point on, of the war because up until this point, it didn't look like the colonists had a, had a chance. And no one really wanted to support the colonists 
until they had proven themselves in the battlefield. So France recognizes the U.S. and sends troops, and General Howe will surrender because he starts to see the war in terms of a not winnable war. So this is a major turning point for those reasons. Now, if you're saying, hey, Mr. Dugdale, that kind of sounds like that would be a good question on the test, then congratulations, you were listening. That would definitely be a test, a test question. What is the turning point of the war? Anytime you hear turning point, uh, red flag, because there's definitely a test question that comes along with that. Okay. So I digress, but I hope everyone got what I was just saying. So the House of Commons in 1778, they decided to make a few really important steps that should have ended the American Revolution, okay? They decided that they were going to uh, to repeal the Townsend Act, the Navigation Acts. All the major laws were going to be, you know, basically rescinded and no longer in play, okay? So they're going to do all of those things. Uh, they get rid of the governorship, and everything pre-independence is restored. They knew that they were fighting a losing battle, and no one wanted to you know, take the steps to really get a victory here, okay? You don't want to have to kill everybody. The colonists ignored it and said, no, 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 we're pushing on. This almost blew up in their faces. Now, Benjamin Franklin, okay, that sexy beast right there, okay, he had secured an alliance with the French, okay? Don't think that the French just saw this and thought, okay, we're good. We're all on the same side now. You know, victories right around the corner. The French had to be convinced, and that's what he—that's what Benjamin Franklin did. So, what was he doing? He was in France, raising money by, you know, giving speeches, and in some cases, sleeping with women, and having them give him money so that he can donate that. Now, that's Benjamin Franklin at age ninety, but in his sixties and seventies, while this is going on. He is a pretty stocky guy. He's brilliant. And, uh, well, women loved him. Okay. Now, by the way, this will end his marriage. And also his son will excommunicate him for this. His son is a loyalist. Uh, but he goes and he makes an agreement with uh, France. And France agrees to provide gunpowder. Now, this discussion really had started earlier than this, and they've been providing almost all of the gunpowder for the United States for two and a half years before Saratoga, but now they can send over their army, and now they can also send over uh, their navy. So France signs with the United States the Treaty of Alliance. They recognize the U.S. as a nation, and once you're recognized as a nation, you can ask other nations for help. Uh, they make an agreement that they will not seek peace. Neither France nor the colonies will seek peace without the other side, you know, signing off. And they also guaranteed that France will get back all of their islands in the Pacific. Now, luckily for the United, well, for the colonies at the time, I, I, I don't want to call them United States yet because not really the case. But uh, fortunately for the colonies. There were a lot of people that hated the British, okay? And among these are, uh, well, Russia with Catherine the Great. You also have uh, the Holy Roman Empire. You have Sweden. You have Norway. Uh, you have uh, Prussia. You have, let me think, who, who am I forgetting? That might be it. So... All of these people get together, all these countries get together, and while they're not actively sending over troops, they are harassing the British on the high seas, and they think it's about time that the British get their comeuppance. Okay. Uh, also during this time, the Comte de Rochambeau uh, arrives in Rhode Island with 6,000 troops to support the colonists. So let me see, who did I forget earlier? Denmark. I, I don't know if I said Denmark. Holy Roman Empire, oh, and Portugal, I forgot Portugal. Uh, now, up above that, you have the United States and France. Spain 
while they weren't sending over troops to help the United States, were in Florida and they forced the British to send some of their troops there, you know, because Spain was trying to take back uh, Eastern Florida. Uh, East, yeah, Eastern Florida. Holland helped by giving the United States a loan, okay, uh, because they needed money in order to uh, conduct war. Okay, now George Rogers Clark. If any of you have heard of uh, William and Clark, okay, this is where George Rogers Clark comes into play, okay? He captures three British forts in the Ohio region, okay? And he gives it to the United States. Uh, these battles are very violent and very costly. And uh, once he takes over to show that the uh, British weren't really doing their job to take care of them, they start massacring Native Americans to prove the British couldn't protect them. Okay. I don't know how that makes any sense, but that was his strategy. Okay. And I don't know that I finished this either, but uh, Lewis and Clark. Uh, so Clark is William Clark, and that is the younger brother of George Rogers Clark. Okay. That's where I was going with that. Sorry, I got sidetracked for a minute. Uh, Daniel Boone during the war. Uh, he was also fighting out in the West. Uh, at one point, his army was outnumbered 30 to 400, and uh, and they didn't lose the battle. They didn't win, but they, they went to a draw and actually drove away the, the force that outnumbered them 13 to 1. Uh, in the fighting, he was shot twice. He was captured twice. Two of his sons died. Uh, one of his brothers and two of his brother-in-laws were killed. Okay. Uh, was the brother the one that uh, got his sis got his wife pregnant? Yes, it was. So, a moment of silence to them. I'm going to move on. Okay, John Paul Jones. Okay, uh, John Paul Jones is a Scotsman who decides to fight for uh, the the colonial forces. Uh, he is in love with a French woman, and he he believes that if he does something great, that he will win her heart. By the way, he never does. Okay, uh, so he started attacking and capturing British ships. At one point during uh, Benjamin Franklin's pimping, where he uh, was raising money for the U.S., a French woman gives. Uh, him a ship to give to uh, the U.S. military. So that ship is given to John Paul Jones. In its first battle, it is sinking because, you know, it's half the size of the uh, British ship that is attacking them. So the British pull alongside to pick up uh, survivors and, uh, and, and captives. And as they pull alongside, John Paul Jones, instead of surrendering, yells out, I have not yet begun to fight. And he and his men go on. Now, let's put things in perspective. If a ship is twice the size of another ship, normally that's in length and in width. So whenever it's twice as big, it's actually really four times as big. Okay? So he was outnumbered four to one and still was able to win the day. Uh, like I said, uh, he, he never earned the heart of, of his, uh, his French uh, mistress. Or not mistress, but... The, the woman he admired. Uh, after this, uh, after the American Revolution, he will actually go off to Russia, and he gets hired by Catherine the Great to develop their navy, which was on frozen water most of the time. So, you know, good luck with all that. Now, we have the great, we have the turning point of the war, but it almost all falls apart in Charleston, South Carolina. So it's in Charleston that uh, British General uh, Clinton captures 5,000 troops and 400 cannons. It's the worst colonial defeat and almost ends the war right there. But about the same time that that happens, at King's Mountain, General Nathaniel Green launches an offensive of his own. Okay? And basically what he does is he uh, creates this new strategy where people will go and attack and retreat, attack and retreat, and with large numbers and then back, and with small numbers. So basically, psychologically, 
The British never felt like they could get their guard down because they were constantly being attacked by Nathaniel Green's troops. Okay, uh, so they rehelp, they, they retake Georgia and South Carolina. Okay, and in 1780, 1781, while this is going on, the State of the Union is falling apart. The colonies' money is so devalued for a couple of reasons. One, well, actually, the biggest reason why it's devalued is the British were making counterfeit currency for the Confederacy. Okay, and uh, And they created so much counterfeit currency that they increased the money supply by about 40 fold. And so currency was only worth two and a half cents on the dollar. Okay. This is a strategy that uh, the, the North will use during the Civil War. And also the, uh, the Nazis would use during World War II against the British and, you know, also start to work towards doing that against the Americans before the wars ended. Now we go to Benedict Arnold, who is generally known as the greatest traitor in the history of the United States, but I find him to be a sympathetic uh, figure. Uh, all he wanted was recognition for, you know, what he did for the war. Okay, and for, for America, he wanted to be one of the founding fathers. He wanted everyone to remember him as doing great things. But the problem was everyone else was getting the recognition that was due him. Uh, at Fort Ticonderoga, you know, all, everything was given to Ethan Allen, even though he came up with the attack that helped them win the fort. Uh, when he was given the army to go to Quebec to get the French on their side, uh, he, the army he had had smallpox. And whenever he turns it around and starts uh, making inroads against Burgoyne and even leads the charge that, that causes... Uh, colonial forces to win. It was Gates that won the uh, that won the day that got all the credit instead of uh, Arnold. So at this point, uh, the British can can see that he's not getting his credit. So they uh, they make an offer to uh, Benedict Arnold to let him go to Britain to make him a general in the British army and also to give him money. And Arnold says, "Yes, I'll do it." 6,300 pounds, make me a general, and uh, and I'll, I'll help you win. In fact, I'll help you take my position of West Point. So he gives, the, uh, he gives a map and uh, basically a location of everything at West Point, which is captured by uh, colonial troops before it gets to the British. And uh, the British go ahead and honor their, their plan to... Uh, to bring in Arnold, and Arnold really has a tragic life afterwards. He's really not welcome anywhere, and he dies almost penniless in uh, Great Britain. Okay, so this leads us to the end of today. Okay, uh, we have the end of the revolution coming up in two days. Then we have the Constitution. Then we have the first days of the new republic. So I hope everyone's having a great day. Uh, love and peace and what, what? I'll uh, talk to you in two days. Everyone have a great day. Well, actually, I'll talk to you in four. Anyway, I'll talk to you in four.